Romans. I love this book of Romans. You know, I got a new computer. Dad, Kevin, I can't even, I didn't, I didn't even know how to turn it on until I got Janet down there. And then I, I programmed, or the, we call them apps now. The apps that I had are no longer there. And so I'm having a hard time. I, the one, and if you notice on my outlines and everything, I have a certain font, font. It doesn't have this font on the new one. So I got to come up with a different font. So next week, because I had this one already done before I had this computer, next week you'll see a different font on my outline. Hey, Paul the Apostle is the title of this message today. And you know, that Paul was, was something else, you know that? And I, I just love Paul so much. He would have been one of my main buds growing up. But what primarily motivated this great apostle Paul? What was his motivation? You know, there had to be all kinds of different motivations, but what was the primary motivation of Paul? I had to stop and think about myself when I when I wrote that down, when I typed it out. Well, what is what's my primary motivation? What is the one thing that makes my clock tick or makes my mop flop? What may it motivates Bob? I hope by the time we're through this message, you'll, you'll find out what motivates Bob. The question I had to ask myself this morning, though, as I sat down, I had to try to analyze it myself and uh, to see what I would find out about myself. And I didn't like a lot of what I found out. And so, I have to try to pray about that because sometimes I don't know how to undo some of those things except through prayer. And uh, so I praise God for that. Romans 1, 1 to 7. And I'm reading the New King James. And I, I've said this before. The reason I selected the New King James is because all personal pronouns are capitalized. Yes. And the ESV is not capitalized. And I love the ESV, and I study out of the New King James for that simple reason. And by the way, well, no, no by the ways. Romans 1, 1 to 7. This is a lengthy salutation. You know, Paul has got a lot of weight in his sails. He starts out, I, Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle. Now listen, let me stop here and say this. This is Paul's claim here. He's been called to be an apostle. That's a mighty, mighty big claim. You know. He says, I've been called to be an apostle. He says he was separated, which means that he was set apart from this one primary motivation that was now in his life. So he was separated from the gospel of God. And verse 2 says, which he promised before through his prophets and the Holy Scriptures. Concerning his son Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God with power according to the spirit of holiness by the resurrection from the dead. Through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. To all who are in Rome, beloved of God, called to be saints. I think I told you this before. I told my mama one time, I'm a saint. She said, oh, Bobby, I know you. You're, you're not anywhere near a saint. I, I said, well, I, I'm declared a saint. Not that I declared it, but the word of God declares me to be a saint. And you know, if you belong to Jesus Christ, and if you come to him in faith, believing that he is who he said he is, and that he did what he promised to do, something you couldn't do for yourself, then you're also a saint. Right. And if you're not, then you better get with the program. Because nothing enters into heaven but God's saints, Amen. his people. Grace to you, Paul says this, grace to you and peace from God our Father 
and the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, I can't think of anything that we need more than peace, peace with God, peace of mind, peace of heart, and also a, a peace from God. Amen. A peace from our Father. Well, listen, you know that I'm crazy about Martin Luther. And I thank God that Martin Luther is not a Lutheran. He's Martin Luther. And he said this, The epistle of the Romans is the true masterpiece of the New Testament. And the purest gospel, which is well worth and deserving, that a Christian man should not only learn it by heart, word for word, but also that he should daily deal with it as daily bread of men's souls. It can never be too much or too well read, studied, and the more it is handled, the more precious it becomes and the bitter, better it tastes. Well said, Mark. Mark. Right. You know, he's quite a guy, Mark. You know, he taught uh, this book in the seminary. He taught Romans. Now, I, I had his devotion, his devotional commentary on, on, uh, on Paul, on, on Romans, excuse me. Paul wrote this letter in 58 AD from Corinth. And you know, I remember Dad Gardner, uh, Dad, Dad Gardner told George Gardner, said nothing good ever came out of Corinth. And, and so he stopped one time at a church that was called the Corinthian Baptist Church. And he went in and he told them, he said, my dad said nothing good ever came out of court. And you got the name on your front out there, this is the Corinthian Baptist Church. You know, we have a Corinthian Baptist Church in Dayton, by the way. Paul wrote this letter in 50 AD from Corinth. Twice in this letter, Paul spoke of his desire to visit Rome. And once in Acts 19.21, he had a strong motivational desire to go to Rome. But you know what? The Holy Spirit had something else in mind for Paul. And it wasn't to go to Rome. It was to write this letter. Uh, and after that, well, let's see, he had other work that prevented him from making this journey. Acts 15.25 And after that, work completed, he would see Rome in Acts 1921, but he didn't want to go there the way he went there. I can tell you that. But you know what? It was a great opportunity for him to minister and to witness to the goodness of God. Right. You know, you, you have to do that wherever you go. You know, if you're in jail, Lord forbid, you need to be a witness there. If you're in the grocery store, you need to be a witness. If you're pumping gas, you need to be a witness. And remember what I told you you can be a witness. But you must testify to what you've seen and heard and you understand. Since it, since it being impossible for him to go to Rome, Phoebe, who is now preparing for her trip to Rome, gave Paul the opportunity to write a letter and have her deliver it. And Phoebe was a female minister in Corinth. Or, I can't, century, I think it is. Uh, and she helped Paul earlier. So she was great help to Paul, as were a lot of women's uh, women, and especially even with Christ, the women were great in his ministry. So there's a place for all you women. And I'm not going to go any further than that, because I'll be in deep, deep trouble. Romans 16, 1 and 2. I commend you, Phoebe, our sister who is a servant of the church in Caesarea, that you may receive her in the Lord in a manner worthy of the saints and assist her in whatever business she has need of. For indeed, she has been a helper of many and of myself also. Isn't that good? The women were really ministering to Paul. And by the way, the women were really ministering to Jesus Christ also. They were not in the forefront because it was the apostles and those disciples were all men. But the women were really the ministers behind the scenes. In fact, I would say, I'd go this far to say that they were the real deacons during that time. The women were. 
Paul, a bondservant of Jesus Christ, called to be an apostle, separated to the gospel of God, which he promised before through his prophets in the Holy Scriptures concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David according to the flesh. It means he was a real person. He was the God-man. He was fully God. He was fully man. He didn't have an a earthly father. Uh, Joseph was his stepfather, so to speak. You know? But he had no father but the father. The father was his father. What God promises, God always delivers on. Mm -hmm. You know, when you get in the word of God, if you see a promise in there, hang your hand on it. Start praying about it. Because God never goes back on his promises. If he says, Lo, I'm with you always, even unto the end of the age, hey, he's with you right now. He's with you when you get in your car, and you leave, and when you go home, whatever you're going to do after you get there, he's with you. And you, you should realize that. Remember that, I think there was a, a book out or a song out, God is my co pilot. That uh, goes back a long time. But he's always there. You know, he's. He's not just omniscient, he's omnipresent. He's everywhere. He's here. And I don't understand how he can be in this church today and every church completely around the world, but he is. And only he can do that. We saw earlier that God was God promised the gospel in Eden. Praise God for his promise of good news for his people. Understanding by God's people, sometimes it takes a long time for his promises of fulfillment. If you read Isaiah, you'll see that. A lot of promises that took eons to be fulfilled. You know, I have one Bible that has the promises over here and the fulfillment over here. So you can go back and see all of those Old Testament promises and how they were fulfilled in the New Testament. So we praise God that God keeps his promises. Another one that I love, and by the way, I just got his complete set on Romans. Janet said you need another set like you need a whole man, but I, I needed Donald Gray Barnhouse's complete set on Romans. I only had one volume of that, and it really was on, on man and, the, and the, the depravity of man, if you will. Now I got the whole thing on Romans. I love it. Donald Gray Barnhouse said this. There are seven things said about the gospel in this chapter. One, it is the gospel of God. You know that the gospel is of God. And the gospel emanated out of the mind of God. And I know that when he knew everything that was going to happen from start to finish, he knew how evil was going to have a heyday. He knew how people, his people, his called out people, his saints, would need a gospel. Amen. They need a gospel. Your, your friends need a gospel. And, it, and if they don't show up in church, they're never going to hear it. Unless they hear it from you or from me. So I praise God for that. So the gospel is the gospel of God. Two, it's the promise, it is promised in the Old Testament. You know, it didn't just happen in the New Testament, but it was promised way back in Genesis. Right away, it was promised, the gospel. Number three, it concerns the Lord Jesus Christ being the gospel of God's Son. Four, it must be preached. Five, it is the power of God and the salvation. You know that when you witness and you testify of the goodness of God and you speak these words, the power of God is embedded in that gospel. And that power of God will have its way in whatever he chooses to have his way in with that. So there'll be fruit from that. You may not see it. It may not last until... You're long gone, but 
but there will be fruit from it. You know, a tree bears fruit, but it just doesn't happen overnight. You know, it starts out as a sapling, it grows, it gets branches. Next thing you know, it has leaves, and the next thing you know, it starts producing fruit. Well, that's you and me. At some point in your journey, you should be producing fruit. Fruit for the glory of God. For it must be preached, it must be spoken of. It is the power of God and the salvation. And six, it was to the Jew first and then to the Gentile. And seven, it is the revelation of the righteousness of God. Oh, I love that. When we get into, further into uh, Romans, you're going to find that righteousness of God is all over the place. Revel uh, Romans 16, 3 says, Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the Son of God, with power according to the Spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead. Now let me stop there and say, I, I'm, I'm a dummy. I'll just admit that to you. I was a dummy in school. I struggled in college to get C's, and then I got... D's, then I got some A's. So I'm a dummy. I have to learn everything the hard way. Grammar never came natural to me. I don't know about you, but I murdered the king's English. And, uh, but listen to this. And the reason I'm telling you all that is this. <clears throat> Concerning his son, Jesus Christ, our Lord, who was born. Now listen. That is passive voice. I'm excited because I learned something about this about a month and a half, two months ago when I was studying. Passive voice. Passive voice means that something is being done to you. Something was being done. Someone caused his being to be born. The Father said that. Passive voice. It says, Jesus Christ our Lord was born. His passive voice. Why? Because the Father said Jesus. That's why. You see, if, you, if you're like me and you're dumb, and you just have to learn this stuff all over again, you don't know this until you start studying. So when you see that word buzz, or was, to be, were, are, those things, are going to be an indicator to you. Okay, let's go. Concerning his son, Jesus Christ our Lord, who was born of the seed of David, according to the flesh, and declared to be the son of God with power, according to the spirit of holiness. See, there's another one, to be. Passive voice. Well, well who's the power behind that to be? It says there, according to the spirit of holiness. The Holy Spirit is that power. See? It says, uh, power according to the spirit of holiness, by the resurrection from the dead, through him we have received grace and apostleship for obedience to the faith among all nations for his name, among whom you also are the called of Jesus Christ. Paul said, it's not just me, it's you people too. See? Yeah, I'm, I'm up here, and I'm leading the pack, but you're a part of it, too. You're, you're not some kind of an absentee believer. You're supposed to be actively involved in all of this, every one of you. And I've said this before. Some of you are not, and some of you are afraid to be. And I understand that. But you know what? That's not my personality. My personality is something I say something to everybody. I talk to people when I'm pumping gas. So it's, I'm no stranger to that. But some of you are not like that. See? Some of you are not like that. And so what you have to learn to be is a little more aggressive. You have to come out of your shell in order to be a witness and a testifier of the goodness of God. God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the divine man, had a short but profitable life. And I'll stop right there. When I, 
when I when I put those words down there, I had to stop and say to myself, God, how profitable is your life? God is pouring so much into you, Bob. Where's the profit? God's only begotten Son, Jesus Christ, the divine man, had a short but profitable life for all who are his followers. Much of what we have told in the four Gospels, in these short verses we have Paul's biography of the divine man. And I have to ask, how profitable has my life been? How profitable? And if there is some profit to it, could it be more profitable? Could it be more profitable than it was or isn't? Now hang on, I'm getting real close to being done. I, I got lots of time yet, too. So, Christ, here's what I wrote after that. Christ is and was. Look, passive voice. Is and was. Passive voice. Why was he is and was? Because the Father said him. That's why he is and was. Christ is and was the noblest of all men. Because he and only he was begotten of the Father, of the Father God. Christ is the divine man according to the flesh. He was man and he was God in the flesh. Hey, folks, I'll get to this in a little bit, but I, I can't resist saying it right now. Find me one other religion that says those kinds of things about its leader. I'm glad there's no Muslims here today because I'm going to tell you, Islam had no savior. And the only way for people who are Islamic of faith is to be Jesus oriented. He's the God man. Muhammad died. And they got his tomb somewhere over there. Christ died and his tomb is empty. Christ is the God-man. He's the divine man sent from the Father. The central focus of the gospel is God's Son. The good news is all about God's Son. It's all about God's Son. Again, I knew the Barnhouse who said, Jesus Christ, strictly speaking, had no religion. Ooh. Because he was God. He didn't need a religion. You and I need a religion. And by God's grace, we've selected Christianity. He cannot, Barnhouse goes on to say, he cannot worship, for there would be no one to worship but himself. He prayed, but only in accommodating sense, since he was talking to the Father as an equal. You know, that's an interesting statement. You know that all three persons of the Blessed Trinity are co-equal. Right. Christ is not higher above than the Holy Spirit, and the Father is not higher above than Christ. They're co-equal in all things, because they're all God. And there's only one God, right. and all three of them are bound up in that one God. And you know what? That's for our accommodation. And we have to understand that because the Trinity is a mysterious uh, thing that we can't understand. It's a principle that goes beyond our understanding. Okay, and it said, but only in the accommodated sense of our prayer, since he was talking to the Father as an equal, he even went so far as to say that these prayers, dialogues within the Godhead, were spoken aloud in order that the disciples might learn something about the relationship of the eternal Son and the eternal Father. So when he prayed out loud, it was only for their benefit because he knew, you know, he was praying to himself in one sense. But they needed to hear it. They needed to hear it. What do you need to hear this morning? John 11, 41 to 43. I love this. And Jesus lifted up his eyes and said, Father, I thank you that you have heard me. You know, 
You know, I, I, I can honestly say that I have never prayed and said, thank you for hearing me. But Jesus did. And he goes on to say, and I know that you always hear me. But because of the people who are standing by, I said this, that they may believe that you sent me. You know, Christ was the first missionary really to hit this planet. Now, the gospel of God. What one commentator said of this gospel of God, I don't, I don't put his name down there because I don't know what his name was, but I just know he was a commentator. He said this in quote, What God has promised through 4,000 years cannot have grown old in 2,000 years. You think the gospel's old hat? Not old hat. It's as new and fresh today as it was 2,000 years ago. Amen. God's work cannot grow old till their task is done. You know, I said this earlier. Christianity is the only religion with a Savior. You can, you can go to any religion you want. And believe me, there was a time in my life when I viewed uh, religion as a candle that had all these rays going off of it. And here, over here was Islam, and here was Hinduism, and here was Buddhism, and here was Christianity, and here was this, and here was this. All of those things that come off of that candle, they're all the same. That's how I thought. But you know what? God told me different. He told me that only in Christianity do you have a Savior. Only in Christianity do you have someone who came and stood in your place as your advocate. He was your lawyer before God the Father and said, she's mine, he's mine, he's mine, she's mine. You know? And when he said that, you know what that meant? hands off. They belong to me. You know, that's I woke up, of course I didn't get much sleep last night, but when I woke up I kept thinking this, Bob, you're no longer your own. You've been bought with a price. You belong to him. <laughs> him and him alone. Okay. Okay, the gospel of God. What, and what God has promised through 4,000 years cannot have grown old in 2,000. God's works cannot grow old till their task is done. And that's the end of the quote. Now, I, I, I received my latest edition of Gruden's Systematic Theology, and I love the first edition, and so I was excited to dig into the new edition. And here's what I saw, Christ speaking now. Whoever comes to me, I will never cast out. I will never cast out. Listen, you may be struggling with where you are in this whole spirit of things about Christianity and that. But here's what I say to you. If you have come to Christ and said to him, I want you to be my Savior. I want you to be my God-man, if you will. I want you to be the divine factor that walked the planet Earth. I want you to be my very own. Jesus said this, I'll never cast you out. Listen, you, I'm planning on dying. You know, a lot of times I say that to people. How are you doing, Bob? Well, I'm planning on, I, if I was any better, I'd be dead, I'd tell them. Well, they get all aghast at that. But the fact of the matter is, I know where I'm going. Do you know where you're going? And if you know where you're going, it's the only because you really know who Jesus Christ is. Right. But here's what Wayne Burton said. The doctrine of the gospel call is important because if there were no gospel call, we could not be saved. How are they to believe in him of whom they have never heard? The gospel call is important also because through it, 
God addresses us in the fullness of our humanity. He does not save us automatically without seeking first a response from us. You must respond. You must respond from us. Rather, he addresses the gospel call to our intellects, to our emotions, to our wills. He speaks to our intellects by explaining the facts of salvation in his word. He speaks to our emotions by issuing a heartfelt personal invitation to respond. He speaks to our wills by asking us to hear his invitation and respond willingly. You want to use your will? Use it to respond to Christ. He says to respond willingly in repentance and faith, to decide to turn from our sins and receive Christ as our Savior and rest our hearts in him for salvation. And the old hymn says, trust and obey, for there is no other way. And if he says, come to me in faith and in repentance, you know I said this when I was preaching on repentance here, the first words that came out of John's, John the Baptist's mouth was repent. The first words that came out of Christ was repent. Repentance is turning from your sin and turning to God. And I'll tell you something. There's a godly repentance that will get you to heaven. And there's an earthly repentance that will send you to hell. Because it's not a repentance. It's, if you're going like this, I'm sorry for that sin. And then tomorrow you're sorry for that sin. And the next day you're sorry for that sin. That's an, er, that's an earthly repentance. But godly repentance says, forgive me my sins. I sinned and grieved the most high God. And please forgive me my sins. Trust and obey, for there's no other way. God is the author of salvation. And his call goes out in the gospel, and it requires a response. Can this be any clearer? Repent then, turn from your sin, and turn to God in Christ Jesus. And you better respond to the gospel, because it's the gospel of God. Father, we thank you. We thank you that you have spoken here this morning in your word. And we praise you and we thank you. And our trust and our hope and our confidence goes out to the Most High God. For you are our Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And all the provision that you've made in our lives is to bring us to your Son, Jesus. And for that, we thank you and we praise your holy name. Amen.